Hey, my name is Seam Lund, and today we're doing another Q&A. The first question is, what are some supplements that can affect your muscle growth in a negative way? I've mentioned several times in my videos and in my books as well that doing some sort of like severe anti-inflammatory intervention after a resistance training workout specifically has been found to be associated with reduced muscle growth and it could also affect like strength gains in a negative way slightly. There's no evidence that it's going to apply to endurance exercise, but muscle growth per se uh, does appear to be uh, like uh, negative affected by uh, massive anti-inflammatory interventions after a workout so cold baths like ice baths for several minutes are gonna be doing that a cold shower probably isn't strong enough for that but the same applies to some of these anti-inflammatory supplements specifically like vitamin c vitamin e nac is also in this category and all these like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin ibuprofen, etc. They can also affect your muscle growth in a negative if you take it after a workout. Now, there are some other supplements as well that could have effects on, you know, other parts of gains or other aspects of physical performance. So, resveratrol is uh, something that has been found to reduce VO2 max and uh, possibly also like testosterone levels in elderly men specifically. So uh, it's one of those supplements that you, you know, really don't want to take even before the workout if your goal is like VO2 max or optimal testosterone levels. Metformin isn't a supplement, but it's a pharmaceutical and it fa has like similar findings that it can affect VO2 max in a negative way and uh, also lower testosterone levels. But most important is that like these anti-inflammatory supplements, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, uh, beta carotene possibly and uh, NAC are the most like uh, common supplements that might have this kind of effect but the most potent effect will probably come from this NSAIDs, aspirin, ibuprofen etc. Another follow-up question was can astaxanthin affect muscle growth? There is uh, quite interesting studies about astaxanthin having a positive effect on testosterone levels not in all studies, so it's kind of, uh, you know, not so completely clear if it has that effect, but uh, in a few studies they do find that azaxanthin has a positive effect on testosterone levels. Now, azaxanthin also has been found to reduce aspects of muscle damage after a workout, so people who are doing high-intensity exercise, soccer, or some other, like, high-intensity sports, uh, they find that their muscle damage and muscle soreness is uh, lower when they're taking astaxanthin. Now, I'm not sure if this can also affect muscle growth in a negative way because, yeah, like reducing inflammation, having an antioxidant effect, uh, they can be counterproductive for muscle growth. So I haven't found any study linking astaxanthin supplementation to lower muscle growth or in inhibition of muscle growth, but it does reduce muscle damage, which can be great for if you're wanting to recover from the exercise faster but it can be also more like suboptimal if your goal is muscle hypertrophy and interestingly omega-3s omega-3 supplements they actually find that it helps with muscle growth so supplementing with omega-3s actually has been found to be associated with higher muscle growth especially in the elderly people so it's kind of interesting that uh, omega omega-3s they have anti-inflammatory effects but uh, they don't appear to have a negative effect on muscle growth Regardless, in my opinion, the best time to take anti-inflammatory supplements is either before a workout or not on the days that you're doing resistance training with the goal of muscle growth. So uh, you can take anti-inflammatory supplements, NAC, vitamin C, vitamin E, or aspirin or whatever it is, but uh, do it on not on the days that you're lifting weights. Next question, gelatin powder instead of glycine, and can you drink, eat it as it is? So gelatin powder, regular beef gelatin powder, is an excellent source of uh, glycine. So uh, it's about like one-fifth of it is going to be glycine. So if you're having 100 grams of gelatin powder, then about 20 grams of it is a glycine, which is a large amount. But at the same time, of course, you're not going to be eating the gelatin powder with a spoon. You know, maybe you are. <laughs> you're like a different breed in that case. But, uh, you know, technically you could just, yeah, eat the gelatin powder with a spoon and you will be getting the glycine. Your body will absorb the glycine. I guess the easier or tastier way to consume gelatin powder would be to just make jello out of it so you can use gelatin powder to make your actually dessert jello with uh, some berries or some fruits or something else that kind of sweetens the taste, then you have a very healthy and high glycine uh, dessert. So I make it myself uh, quite frequently, but um, if I don't have time to wait several hours to make the jello, then I'll just mix it with maybe like yogurt or something else like that, and I'll still consume it in a, like a 
flavorable uh, way. But yes, it's a great source of getting glycine and uh, it uh, can be used in a lot of uh, like dishes. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on the cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. Next question, what superfoods do you recommend to consume daily? So this is uh, going to be somewhat of a, not a complete answer because, you know, what categorizes as a superfood is you know depends who you ask and depends what the goal is i do think that there are certain foods that have been found to be universally beneficial with little to no side effects and uh, they have positive associations with health outcomes and uh, mechanistically as well they have certain compounds or ingredients that elicit beneficial responses in the human body so for example i'll list a few of the ones that i you know consume myself on a regular basis uh, pretty much daily and I do think that uh, everyone would uh, benefit from so number one would probably be eggs so perfect amino acid profile uh, fairly bioavailable and uh, it also has choline and also like these other carotenoids lutein zeaxanthin and stuff like that that actually are beneficial for the eyes and the brain so uh, yeah eggs are uh, like a really nice uh, superfood I think then secondly would be olive oil if you have uh, extra virgin olive oil high quality extra virgin olive oil and uh, yeah it's a high source of polyphenols and there's just so much studies linking the consumption of olive oil with reduced risk of heart disease reduced risk of alzheimer's and reduced risk of all cause mortality and the associations are pretty linear that you know the more olive oil you consume the better the uh, outcomes appear to be even between like moderate consumption versus high consumption so the high consumption up to 56 grams a day appears to be better than like 10 grams of olive oil, olive oil uh, per day so yeah another one of these foods that i think has quite a lot of evidence and um, like uh, mechanistic studies as well that link to this uh, these outcomes now the yeah the issue is that a lot of the olive oils in supermarkets tend to be mixed with some canola oil but i guess here it's also important to appreciate some of the studies so that you know most of these studies I, I don't think these studies used this you know perfectly uh, well formulated uh, olive oil they might have used just a regular olive oil from the supermarket <laughs> so it's hard to say okay even if these studies are done on people consuming olive oil that was mixed with some canola, canola oil or something then appear apparently it didn't jeopardize the results or the outcomes of these people so i would say yeah like if you can find a good farm like you establish some sort of a relationship with the farm and uh, make sure that you are getting actual 100 percent olive oil then that's obviously the best option but um and and at the same time buying the cheapest olive oil in the supermarket probably is not a good idea because it's you know very likely it's going to be mixed with some canola oil but uh, slightly more like higher quality like more i guess um believable brands more established brands from the supermarket they're gonna be uh, high quality enough to at least based on the studies to give uh, like health benefits uh, to people uh, consuming them on a regular basis so i wouldn't think you need to be like super crazy with the quality of your olive oil of course if you can find the highest quality then yeah it's gonna be the best best option third superfood in my opinion would be uh, dark chocolate or uh, cacao so uh, this also is a very high source of polyphenols and cacao consumption specifically these flavonoids in cacao and dark chocolate they appear to be linked to lower risk of heart disease and lower mortality as well specifically cardiovascular disease mortality so i think yeah a dark chocolate is uh, pretty pretty like a superfood <laughs> if you could call it uh, that now again the issue is it's might be high in heavy metals so you need to find they are like an established brand preferably like um, from a, like a known source but uh, if you can find high quality 
uh, cacao, raw cacao powder, or uh, high quality dark chocolate, or so anything above like 70% is, is the goal, then uh, that would have benefits as well on, on uh, your uh, heart health uh, mostly. The fourth superfood isn't going to be necessarily a superfood. I will put like coffee and green tea into this category. So uh, both of them have a lot of studies pointing that uh, consuming coffee or green tea is linked to lower risk of heart disease, Alzheimer's, uh, liver cancer, diabetes, and uh, all-cause mortality. So uh, yeah, people who consume these beverages appear to have better health. Now with green tea, yes, you could make the argument that it's healthy user bias, that you know, if you are drinking green tea, <laughs> then you're probably healthier as a person because you know most people don't like green tea. Uh, but with coffee, it's hard to say that it's healthy user bias because most people who drink coffee don't think it's healthy. Like, you know, my parents drink coffee and they think coffee is unhealthy. And uh, most, you know, if you can draw like a Venn diagram between people who smoke and people who drink coffee, then almost everyone who smokes also drinks coffee. So it's hard to say that people who drink coffee are kind of these healthier people because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, people in the mix of these studies that also follow unhealthier lifestyle habits or they're not particularly special with their lifestyle habits. So I wouldn't say that yeah, coffee consumption is healthy as a bus. Uh, maybe with green tea it is and I'm consuming like maybe two cups of coffee a day and a green tea as well, one to two cups of uh, green tea uh, per day. Now there's also like a bunch of other foods that could be on this list. You could put salmon, you could put a herring, which is you know the highest source of uh, creatine in the world, and it's also high in taurine and uh, omega threes and stuff like that. Beef you can put into into here, liver, uh, you know, sweet potatoes, carrots, whatever. I mean, healthy food should be considered like superfood in says, but you know, not all these kind of foods would be people aren't something that people would consider to be super foods. So I think, uh, yeah, healthy food is just uh, going to have a positive effect on your health. And there's a lot of different kinds of healthy foods out there. If you just stick to the whole food matrix, then most of these food could be categorized as super foods because you, yes, you could, you know, point out a specific ingredient in them, like, um, you know, blueberries, they're going to have these uh, anthocyanins and other kind of polyphenols that uh, have a positive effect on your health and they are linked to better health outcomes. So yeah, like you could pretty much pick a single ingredient or compound from any whole food and you can find some evidence to indicate that it will have some positive ex effects on your health. So uh, yeah, I'll just, I guess I'll just cap, uh, <laughs> cap the list. At this point, my, my personal top superfoods that I consume on a daily basis would be yeah, like eggs, olive oil, uh, coffee, tea, and uh, some maybe some fish and uh, something something like that. Next question, what in your opinion are key supplements for a woman of 50 to take daily? All right, so with age, there are obviously many changes that occur related to both aesthetics, physical function, cognitive function, and overall aging. Now in your 50s, you are still, I guess, considered like a middle-aged person, not an elderly person, unfortunately. So uh, the, you know, the supplements that are beneficial for someone in their 50s are very similar to someone in their 40s and possibly 60s. Now there's going to be obviously a lot different supplements if you're like 70s or 80s or at least more of like more benefits you would expect from these kind of supplements if you're the older you are and the younger you are the kind of less supplements you technically uh, need for from an anti-aging and longevity perspective. But I'll list like a few supplements that I think anyone pretty much all of ages would benefit from including the ones in their 50s so collagen supplementation collagen peptides i think anyone everyone starting from the age of 20 would already benefit from collagen peptides because your skin collagen content starts decreasing already in your 20s and uh, collagen peptides have multiple clinical trials showing that it helps with skin anti-aging and wrinkles and skin elasticity so you know it's it has an aesthetic effect it helps to slow down facial aging, but um, the uh, skin health or skin wrinkles, maintaining skin elasticity is also important for like overall health and reducing the risk of uh, you know uh, other ailments. So like your skin is a massive organ and it's it's like a barrier as well against the outside world. So you would want to have good skin health for just overall longevity as well. Second supplement I think a woman in their fifties would benefit from is probably creatine. So uh, creatine is one of the most evidence-based supplements there is, like hundreds, thousands of studies even. 
finding that it helps with muscle growth, muscle strength, speed, uh, power, and bone density as well, including cognition and uh, brain. So in the elderly people, supplementing creatine monohydrate is found to improve memory. And uh, in everyone else, in all age groups, it also improves muscle strength and uh, possibly muscle mass as well. The, the effects is, is more for the muscle strength side. But uh, in your 50s already, and as a female, you uh, would all definitely want to you know, start thinking about maintaining muscle mass as much as possible into your elderly years. So creatine is a definitely one of those supplements virtually everyone of all age would benefit, but the older you get, the higher the importance becomes of uh, getting extra creatine. Another supplement I think is worthwhile in your 50s would be glycine and NAC. So glycine and NAC also have several clinical trials showing that it helps with increasing glutathione levels, this master antioxidant, and this reduces inflammation and also affects multiple other hallmarks of aging, as well as improves functional outcomes like grip strength, walking speed, body composition, and uh, those kind of things. And uh, glutathione starts declining somewhere in your mid 40s. So in your 50s, you're like a prime target to start supplementing with uh, NAC and glycine. But uh, when you're younger than that, it might not be that effective. Now, NAC also has studies in lower doses and in younger people that it helps still with aspects of inflammation, maybe like liver enzymes. Uh, so uh, it is worthwhile to take as well if you're younger. It's just not going to have that big an effect. And it might have a bigger effect if you have higher inflammation levels. But in your 50s, there's going to be age-related increase in inflammation called inflammaging and uh, age-related decrease in glutathione. So uh, with age, we are becoming more inflamed. Even the healthy elderly people, they uh, have lower glutathione levels and higher levels of inflammation. So there's almost like, you can't avoid this inflammaging. So there's gonna be some inflammation occurring with uh, aging the older you get. And uh, glycine NAC is one of the most effective supplements uh, against that. So a woman in their 50s might also be postmenopausal. So, uh, you know, with uh, menopause, the uh, risk of osteoporosis increases a lot because of the drop in estrogen levels. So it depends what have you been doing before menopause as a woman. So if you've been lifting weights, you've been eating a high protein diet, you've been eating enough calcium and you have had adequate vitamin D levels all throughout your life, then chances are your bone density would be like normal or high but uh, it would be like beneficial to do like a DEXA scan or something like that to assess your bone density because, you know, a big risk for the elderly people is just hip fractures and falling. So accidental deaths, uh, you know, the leading cause of accidental deaths in the elderly people is uh, falling. So uh, you want to make sure that you don't have low bone density. And after menopause in your 50s, 60s, that's going to be one of the kind of the biggest leading causes of accidental deaths in uh, people. So yeah, uh, calcium supplementation could be worthwhile in this scenario if you have low bone density. If you don't, then I wouldn't recommend taking a calcium supplement. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, you know, high dose calcium supplementation over 1000 milligrams a day is actually you know, linked to some aspects of heart disease and myocardial infarction. So you don't want to take like, you know, calcium in large amounts <laughs> for no reason. But if you have low bone density, and your calcium levels are low, and you're not eating any dietary calcium, then uh, it, it would be better to like, like a small dose of calcium supplement as well. But yeah, only if you have low uh, bone density, in my opinion. Now, there's also like a bunch of other supplements that you could take. You know, you could take astaxanthin for uh, improving inflammation, improving blood pressure, improving metabolic syndrome, and protecting your skin against UV radiation. You could take some of these other carotenoids. You could take vitamin K2. You could take vitamin K1. You could take magnesium. So there's, you know, obviously a whole list of supplements you, you could take, but uh, whether or not you need to or want to depends on, yeah, what's your health like, what your biomarkers like, because, uh, yeah, some of these supplements are not going to be worth it unless you have, you know, high inflammation or high cholesterol or high blood sugar or, or whatever the case may be. So you can check out my free supplement list that I'm taking and I'm listing out some of these other supplements that uh, do uh, work based on the evidence and uh, I guess the link is in the description. Next question, can you elaborate on what you do to treat elbow pain from lifting? So this is in response to my Instagram story where I was talking about that I'm 
getting a little bit of a like not, not like any severe pain but just like a nagging pain in my elbow uh, because of uh, doing a bit of too like over enthusiastic muscle ups <laughs> so i was i've been training some muscle ups over the past few uh, weeks usually in the summer when uh, the weather is warm i'm just you know working out outside mostly and i'm doing muscle ups so i guess i was a bit too eager or i got into it too fast and i when you're doing muscle ups then you have to do like a very deep dip and some of sometimes the kind of elbows can get a bit uh, sore from that and what i was doing is i was just doing like this very slow biceps curls with the resistance band to help with the blood flow to the tendon in my elbow and to help with the, like recovery and uh, pretty much strengthening the elbow so the difference between your muscles and elbows is that or like your tendons is that the, the tendons and ligaments it's much harder to like train them and uh, they take a lot longer to recover so one of the best ways to like strengthen your joints and tendons is to just do these slower repetitions and more controlled repetitions to direct as much blood flow to these regions because they don't have very good blood supply and that's also the reason why they're very like prone to injuries so these are tendons and the elbows knees hips etc so just doing like this super slow and high repetition uh, like, like whatever movement it is like either the biceps curl push-ups or squats or lunges just do them like slowly controlled and with very high repetitions just like experience the muscle pump and you know, through like direct blood flow to those regions that's what i'm doing you know pretty regularly uh it's just sometimes when you're not warming up properly you might you know get a little bit of uh, nagging pain from doing that i actually did have you know several years ago like by now it was like almost eight years ago i had a minor like tennis elbow in my uh, i guess it was left arm or i don't remember which arm it was but uh, yeah, it was <laughs> from the same reason I was doing muscle ups. Uh, at that point, I wasn't like strong enough to do the muscle ups. I was again too uh, fast to progress with the movement. So I hurt my tendon, and it had like uh, some uh, tendon pain for several months. And during that time, I wasn't able to do like pull ups that well. So I had to do the like, super slow push ups only, super slow resistance band curls. But after that, you know, my tendons and my elbow was much stronger than it was before. And I was able to do like muscle ups very easily and heavy pull ups with, you know, 100 kilos. <laughs> so, you know, it goes to show that your body can become stronger from injuries. The key is obviously to not train in a way that gets you injured. But, uh, you know, the longer you train, the more years you have under your belt as a resistance training uh, person, then uh, you eventually will get some I guess minor injuries. I've never had any serious injuries, fortunately. But uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've never also been just kind of reckless with uh, my training, apart from just, yeah, maybe a few <laughs> too enthusiastic uh, muscle ups that, uh, you know, for a few weeks will make my elbow somewhat sore. And I, I need to just, yeah, focus on kind of the slower repetitions and high repetitions uh, during that time. You can also use like these blood flow restriction bands. I think those are amazing during this process because you can reduce the load and the intensity of the movement and get more directed response for the like the blood flow. So the resistance resistance bands with these blood flow restriction cuffs is one of the uh, like most amazing way to recover from from these kind of injuries in my opinion. Next question, how much vitamin D is normal? I have a deficiency, now I want to boost it. Vitamin D obviously is an essential hormone and uh, you know the easiest way to increase your vitamin D levels is to get exposed to sunlight. Probably the fastest way to take like large doses of vitamin D as a supplement, but uh, the best way is through direct sunlight exposure. And so what, what is considered to be vitamin D deficiency so it depends who you ask, but the general consensus is that vitamin D below 20 nanograms per milliliter is associated with, uh, is, is considered to be like a vitamin D deficiency. And uh, in nanomoles per liter, that's uh, 50 nanomoles per liter. What's the optimal vitamin D level for all cause mortality and longevity? Then uh, it appears to be something like 30 to 49 nanograms per milliliter, which in the nanomoles is 75 to 99 nanomoles per liter. So somewhere between there is uh, what you want to be with uh, your vitamin D levels. And if you're deficient or low in your vitamin D levels, then yeah, you know, get exposed to sunlight, consuming vitamin D rich foods like egg yolks, fish, and uh, those kind of things is going to be also pretty effective. 
And, but some other like hidden reasons could be that uh, obesity, extra body fat tends to lower uh, vitamin D levels. But in most cases, most people, they're just spending too much time indoors and not enough time outdoors. So uh, you can cover your daily like RDA for vitamin D if you're somewhere around like Spain. So like this near equator kind of countries or these Mediterranean countries, you can cover it during the summer with only like 20 to 30 minutes of uh, sun exposure if you're wearing like you know shorts and a t-shirt if you're not wearing any clothes at all then you can achieve it faster <laughs> but uh, if you're wearing more clothes then it takes more time to reach that and uh, you know if you're in the UK or somewhere higher up north Canada Nor Norway then during the summer you can also yeah achieve the RDA for vitamin D with something like 30 minutes of uh, sun exposure during the winter time in Norway and Canada and Finland and Russia it's, you're not going to be able to probably reach the RDA for vitamin D by just being outside. Uh, so, um, you know, and, you know, interestingly, I've never been vitamin D deficient, probably because I'm eating plenty of vitamin D and I'm um, taking occasionally like a vitamin D supplement as well in the winter months. In the summer, I'm not doing that because my vitamin D would go too high if I were to take vitamin D during the summer. So, yeah, like too high vitamin D levels can also be... Uh, problematic so uh, yeah kind of the sweet spot is in, is in the middle next question after making the basics top three things with the biggest impact uh, i guess i would presume that top three biggest things for like longevity the biggest things that have an impact on longevity and uh, i guess i'll say the basics would be something like your exercising you know three to four times a week your a normal body weight you don't have excess like body fat and your sleeping long enough so you're sleeping something like seven to eight hours those would be the basics so what are the like, top three things above that so i think doing some aspects of high intensity interval training would probably push your results you know further above the basics uh, but uh, further above just regular exercise so the high intensity interval training is a very time efficient way to increase your vo2 max and um, it's also one of the most potent ways to increase your VO2 max in the short term. And if you are doing like a one hit interval, this Norwegian protocol, four by four, four minutes of sprinting or four minutes of like high intensity, four minutes of rest at low intensity, follow up by four rounds. If you do that once a week, then you're going to have a pretty positive effect on your VO2 max and uh, fat loss and uh, other aspects of health as well. So I think exercise is still the most powerful way to improve your health currently and uh, the fitter you are the healthier you're going to be generally as well and uh, if you just exercise more like, like the studies are pretty clear that people who exercise more than is recommended have a lower risk of mortality and lower risk of these chronic diseases as well and they're healthier so exercising almost like up to the elite level appears to provide benefits maybe at the absolute elite level they you might experience some diminishing returns but even then the studies find that the Olympian athletes live about five, five years longer than the general population. So even the elite of the elite, the Olympian athletes, they still live longer than uh, the general population. So I guess for the average person, it means that just exercising a lot more than you are currently will still give you more benefits. So almost all of us aren't exercising too much, <laughs> if that makes sense. If you're exercising even five to six times a, a week, for one hour every day then it's still not uh, too much so to say if you started exercising two hours every day then uh, maybe you'll start getting diminishing returns but even then it appears that yeah the more you exercise the healthier you'll generally be and i think just adding some form of this uh, high intensity interval training is one of the quickest and most time efficient way to like reap some extra benefits to your health the second biggest impact uh, I, I would say would be some aspects of sauna so i'm a huge fan of sauna and i think that everyone would benefit from some uh, sauna therapy in moderation so uh the kind of optimal protocol is you know 70 degrees celsius four times a week for 20 to 30 minutes that's gonna give you the maximum benefits and uh the interesting thing about the sauna is that you know they find that if you combine taking the sauna with exercise you get better results from the exercise itself so you get better results in terms of lowering blood pressure and increasing VO2 max and increasing HRV. So combining the sauna with exercise is better than just exercise alone. 
So yes, exercise is amazing, but if you do it with a sauna, you're getting more benefits <laughs> from the exercise. And of course, there's all these other studies linking sauna use with lower, lower heart disease, lo lower uh, Alzheimer's, and uh, lower mortality as well. So yeah, I think pretty much everyone would benefit from adding a, you know, four, times a four times a week of sauna. Even once or twice a week is going to be enough or giving you enough for you to get some additional effects, but optimally like the four times a week is the maximum uh, benefits. And number three, I would say that it's actually rest. <laughs> so taking time to rest, you know, you know, yes, putting a lot of hours to exercise and being very fit is one of the most powerful methods to, in to, to promote like health and to increase your fitness and health. But uh, if you're not recovering adequately enough, then uh, you're losing some of the benefits. So a lot of the potential gains also come when you're resting. So yeah, it's kind of this work hard, play hard <laughs> mentality. You need to also rest uh, pretty hard. So that means making sure that you are definitely sleeping at least eight hours if you're exercising a lot and uh, you know not, not feeling bad about taking naps every once in a while and not feeling bad about just, you know, sitting on the couch and uh, doing whatever it is just to kind of uh, relax because, you know, if you are exerting your body quite a lot, which is healthy and appears to be linked to lower risk of mortality, then you also need to kind of put in the hours of uh, rest and uh, relaxation. So these would be my top biggest things. So like being super fit and doing some form of high intensity exercise. Number two, taking a sauna regularly and number three, also resting uh, a lot. Next question, how do you go from 21% body fat to 12% body fat? So the way you go from 21 to 12% or from 30 to 20% is you know, the same kind of process. I have made a video about how would I go from being overweight to fit, but you, know, you can follow some step you know, you don't have to go immediately super aggressive with this uh, weight loss journey. You can follow steps, but you know, it depends where you're starting from. If you are eating junk food, then the easiest way to lose weight is to just eliminate the hyper palatable ultra processed foods. And uh, by doing that and replacing them with leaner proteins and uh, fibrous vegetables, then you'll probably automatically start losing weight quite rapidly. And you'll probably lose a, a few percentages of your body fat just by doing that. The second easiest thing is to just remove extra added fats. So extra butter, extra lard, you know, even like extra olive oil in uh, two large quantities, um, they're gonna make you gain weight. So uh, just extra fats at a certain, you don't need like a ton of fat to be healthy. You don't need a ton of fat for whatever the goal is. For like testosterone production, they find that 40% of your calories as fat is the maximum benefits. So you don't need any more, more than that. So removing extra fats will also make you lose a few percentages uh, of your body fat just by reducing your calorie intake. Third, in, th third thing is to just start increasing not only exercise, you know, yeah, if you are exercising only once a week, then, you know, add, at least you want to do at least three times a week of exercise, go to the gym for that, you know, that will probably also make you gain, uh, like lose weight at the same time. But just increasing the NEAT, so this non-exercise activity thermogenesis, is one of the most underrated ways to uh, lose weight. So that means walking more and trying to be more like animated <laughs> with the movements, trying to maybe do the soleus push-ups that I made a video about recently, where you're doing like seated calf raises while you're, you know, sitting or in the office job. Just any form of movement, uh, it adds up quite a lot. You don't burn a lot of calories doing the exercise itself because you're exercising only like an hour. But if you do a lot of NEAT all throughout the day, then you burn a lot more calories by doing that. So just take the stairs. I uh, you know, have a walking treadmill. I use that quite often every day. When you're stuck somewhere sitting, <laughs> you can't like, you know, uh, you're, you have to do something while sitting, then you can do the soleus push-ups. And yeah, a lot of ways to increase your NEAT. That's the most underrated way to actually lose weight. Just move more, but move in a way that doesn't like make you tired and uh, it kind of adds up over the course of the entire day. Next question, how much fruit do you eat per day? So usually I'll eat maybe two to three pieces of fruit per day and it's gonna be like one apple, one kiwi and some uh, berries. So maybe like blueberries or raspberries, something like that. So yeah, three servings of fruits uh, per day. And uh, yeah, it uh, works great. And I, I don't, I could eat more as well. I, I just, you know, I don't have that much 
I guess, taste for fruit. I, I like the taste, obviously, but it's just so satiating, like how much apples are you going to eat? <laughs> if you eat five apples or five bananas, five kiwis, whatever, it eventually just becomes uh, too much and you get too full by doing that. And the last question is, how harmful are fitness watches like Garmin? My goal is to monitor stats during workouts. So with these smartwatches or these other fitness trackers, I guess the fear is that they emanate EMF and they're somehow harmful to your health by causing this, uh, I guess, inflammation or oxidative stress to your cells. Now, it, it is true that it might be too early in the use of these uh, smart watches and devices to see if it does have any negative effects on your health. It's like the artificial sweeteners. You know, artificial sweeteners have been around for decades. And uh, if they were to be harmful, then we would know already by now. But based on the evidence right now, there's like like no harm to artificial sweeteners uh, any like at least, at least not in like the majority of people some people might yeah, get more cravings by consuming artificial sweeteners but in the general population there appears to be no harm from artificial sweeteners unless you're yeah drinking i guess like you know five liters of <laughs> diet coke per day and the same with like the smart watches smart smart watches are obviously much like uh, younger they've been around for only like a few years maybe 10 years at most so yeah, it's too early to see, okay, what happens to people who use these smartwatches all the time. But this can still be like confounded by this healthy user bias. So people who use smartwatches or like a heart rate monitor or whatever it is, they're also exercising. So, you know, why, why do they use the smartwatch? They use it to track their heart rate while exercising. So it's, it's going to be probably the case that even if these smartwatches were to have any like increase in inflammation, then the benefits you get from exercise counteract that like multifold. <laughs> so the benefits you get from exercise are like, you know, five times better than the small inflammation you might get from this EMF from this smartwatch. But even then, I think the amount of this EMF or whatever other exposure you're getting from them is so small that it probably has no, no effect. And uh, I wouldn't be like worried about using, especially if you're using them only during the workouts. You know, if, you're, if you were to use like uh, Bluetooth headphones and smartwatches 24 seven, then maybe over the course of years, you might have some like increased risk in some conditions. But as of now, there's no evidence that it would do so, even if you were to use them 24 seven. But I guess the best advice is to just not use it 24 seven. If you use it only during the workout, then the benefits you get from the workout are several times greater than any of the potential risk that you or the potential harm that you could get uh, from these uh, smartwatches. And even then, you know, the evidence of any harm is very limited at the moment. All right, that's it for this video. As a reminder, you can now pre-order my new book, The Longevity Leap, at thelongevityleap.com. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem, the Optimize, stay empowered.